Welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all of you tuning in from around India and the rest of the world. We're very excited at the Good Food Institute India to welcome you to the Smart Protein Summit and to kick off the summit in earnest with this keynote session. As you all know, the Good Food Institute India and our global partners are focused on building a more healthy, sustainable and just food system. And I can't think of a better way to begin our summit than with a discussion with Josh Tetrick who founded and runs the company Eat Just Inc. Just is a San Francisco company consisting of scientists, researchers, and Michelin-starred chefs. Their focus on food innovation for a better world has led them to create unique products and entire categories, like the one we all know, of course, the moon bean based egg. Josh has a really interesting background. Prior to founding Eat Just and getting a bunch of plaudits from the likes of the World Economic Forum, Fast Company, etc., Josh has led a United Nations business initiative in Kenya, worked for both former US and Liberian presidents, and of course, he's worked for seven years in Africa in total. Josh is just a fascinating guy overall, and with Eat Just, he's leading a transformation in the global food system. Josh, we're delighted to have you at the summit. Welcome. It's really, it's really nice to be with you, Varun. I'm, uh, I'm excited uh, to get down and, and talk about all these fun topics with you. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for being here. So, Josh, we last saw each other in person at the Good Food Conference in San Francisco. Uh, that was a year ago, and it's been a little bit of a weird year, totally unprecedented, overwhelming globally. Uh, how has the year been for you and the team at Just? It's, it's been a, another year of, of really keeping our heads down uh, and trying to build a world where more human beings are eating eggs from plants than they are eggs from chickens. And obviously, we're, we're not in the same room right now because we're living in a time of zoonotic pandemics. Uh, and as you, as I'm sure many of the folks listening to this and watching this realize, um, that means because we're encroaching too much on uh, the world of animals, right? There's a collision between human beings uh, and animals, which is causing the increased risk of things like this. Um, and I think what's been exciting about a really painful time, and you have to find, um, you have to find the, the solution in, in a lot of pain here, is that more and more eyes are being opened to the kind of food system we have. And that is one that is broken, it's sick, and we need to figure out some way to do uh, to heal it quickly. Um, so I think that's been, there's been an awakening that, that has happened um, in America and in India and elsewhere. Um, and as hard as it is, it's an enormously exciting time to be a part of because now's the time to really change things. We're fortunate to sell our 50 millionth egg uh, made from a plant. Um, we signed a multi-year agreement with the largest provider of eggs in a food service globally. Um, and, and as you know, and, and your viewers can see here, we're living in a time where we can't be next to each other. We're li living in a time of zoonotic disease where um, more and more thing, these things are going to pop up as the human animal collides uh, with every other animal. Um, and although there's a lot of pain uh, and a lot of misery around this time, and uh, there's a lot maybe not to be thankful for, um, we do see the, the excitement and the enthusiasm and the potential for the planet uh, in this place. We see more eyes opening up. A growth for us has been up by uh, 40, 50, 60 percent uh, retailers. We see a higher percentage of people moving away from animal products to plant-based products. I see more people starting companies that are attempting to solve this problem. I see regulators around the world opening up their eyes to it. So, you know, in the pain of COVID, I do think lies the seed to doing something much quicker to transition this food system to one that is healthy, safe, sane, and, and really does align with, with who we are. Yeah, it is really exciting. You also sold your 50 millionth egg this year, is that correct? Five zero, so a uh, little bit over seven years ago, uh, my, uh, my best friend, uh, co-founder Josh Bach and I had the idea that what if we got rid of the assumption that an egg has to come from an animal? We've been assuming that for so long, right? An egg necessarily needs to come from an animal. But what if you think differently about it? What if you think it doesn't have to be the case and an egg can come from a plant? And what you get when you make that decision is a whole lot less water being used, a lot less land, uh, certainly a, a kinder world, a better food system, and ultimately a, a lower cost egg. Um, and we have billions to sell in the future here, but you know, a, many billions starts with a 50 million sold uh, and that happened uh, about a month and a half ago. 
Yeah, and just to give the audience a sense of what Josh is describing, I think he says a whole lot less land and water, but I think he's underplaying it a little bit. So with those 50 million eggs, uh, just has saved, I read Josh, about 7.5 million kilograms of CO2 equivalent, 3,000 acres of land, 1.9 billion gallons of water. That, these are huge gains in sustainability and productivity. It's a huge shift in our food system. But let's go back to the beginning. As you said, um, you started the company about seven years ago, but even before that, you started off as an American football player, and it is American football for the rest of the world. Uh, you wanted to play in the NFL in the US, uh, and life took you to Africa for a long time before you returned to the US, eventually found it just. So yeah. how did you arrive at this mission to change the global food system? Yeah, you're right. I, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, thinking I was going to be a, a professional athlete. Uh, I didn't know global soccer, global football in Alabama. I just uh, just was introduced to American football. Um, eventually played a little bit of college football, realized that I, I probably wasn't good enough uh, to play in the NFL. Um, and then I, I buckled down academically, spent a lot more time with uh, my best friend, Josh Balk, who became the co-founder of the company. Uh, then uh, spent a number of uh, years on and off again in sub-Saharan Africa. I lived in Liberia and Kenya. Uh, and in South Africa, I was doing everything from working with UNDP in Kenya to helping kids get off the street and into school in South Africa. And um, it was an important experience for me, but overall I felt frustrated by it. I felt like it wasn't, um, it wasn't moving as fast as I wanted it to move. The change wasn't as happening as fast as I needed to see it. And when I was in South Africa, I read a book called Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid by a guy named C.K. Pradalad. And the premise, the thesis of the book was, if you want to solve the world's most urgent problems, do it through capitalism. And it, he wasn't saying that nonprofits and, interna and inter international institutions were bad. He was just saying to get stuff done faster, do it through capitalism, and you can ultimately solve the biggest problems faster. And it had a big impact on me. I moved back to the United States. Um, and I, I was thinking about what I wanted to do next with my life. Um, and my best friend, Josh, said, what about the egg? Uh, there are over 1.4 trillion eggs that are laid every year, Josh, he told me. Most of those not laid in a, in a very humane way. What if we could figure out a way to find a plant that scrambles like an egg? Um, and I was all about it. Uh, and then we, we attacked the idea. Um, we were fortunate to raise a little bit of capital for it, and then we're off to the races. Yeah, and we certainly align with your vision of, uh, of markets and technology that is really going to transform the global food system. And it's people like you that are going to, that are going to do that and are doing that, right? So let's, let's get to the bit that you referenced, that, the bit that the audience really, really wants to hear about, the egg. Uh, the just egg is the culmination, as you said, of a huge amount of work you've been doing to unlock the potential of the, of the plant kingdom. Uh, you've, come, you've called it, the company calls it, an amazing toolkit that we haven't tapped into enough yet. So there's, there's over 300,000 plant species in the world, each of which has hundreds of thousands of, um, of its own varietals. Um, and your team discovered that moon beans, uh, or mung beans as they're known internationally, were the perfect base on which to build your hero product, the egg. Now you've told us a little bit about why the egg is your hero product in terms of it's the most consumed animal protein in the world. It's very cheap, it, it isn't quite uh, humanely produced in most cases. Uh, it does lead to a lot of food safety issues, et cetera. But why is the moon bean the base of your hero product and how did you arrive at that conclusion? Yeah, Varun, so if you think about the process of cracking an egg and scrambling the egg. So imagine that you're, um, you're about to eat breakfast, you crack an egg, you pour it in a pan and you're watching it. You got a spatula and you're, you're watching it solidify. Um, the process of solidification in the pan um, is the process that a food science might call gelling. So our challenge was, can we find a plant that gels or solidifies at the same time and temperature that the egg that you cracked in the pan this morning? That was a challenge. So we, we screened through um, uh, many thousands of plants or well over 300,000 as you, as you noted looking for a protein in the plant that would gel at the same time and temperature. Um, I didn't have my site sets on the, set uh, on the mung bean or any particular green, uh, grain. I was just trying to find something that worked. About four years into the process, 
um, we tested a particular varietal of the mung bean, uh, and we noticed in, in the pan that it gelled at approximately the same time and the same temperature as chicken egg protein. In order to get that, we used a, a, this data-driven approach where we connect molecular and functional properties. So instead of looking at the 300,000 plus, we could narrow it down to a particular subset and then more manually search through that. That eventually led us uh, to the mung bean, a, a bean that's been around for well over 4,000 years. I got to say, when my, uh, my team discovered it, not many people on the team um, had, had consumed it. They weren't really familiar with it, uh, except a handful of my food scientists who were born in India, and they very, they very well uh, knew about it. But that was the process of, of finding it. And if you think about it, an egg has been trapped inside the mung bean for thousands of years. We just, figure, we just had to figure out a way to find it, unlock it, separate the protein, and then build a product. And, and the rest is a, a, little bit of, uh, a little bit of egg history. An egg has been trapped inside the mung bean for thousands of years. I love that. But I am going to put you on the spot a little bit here, Josh. Uh, like you said, your Indian scientists knew the mung bean very, very well. The yep. mung bean was first domesticated in India 4,000 years ago. Um, and it's great for cover cropping, so it's fantastic for farmers. And you know, we have you know over 50% of our population is gainfully employed in agriculture or relies on agriculture for employment. Um, we're also the third largest producer of eggs in the world, as you've noted in the past. Um, you've already signed some fantastic strategic partnerships around the world, right? Uh, uh, we've talked about the upstream and downstream manufacturing process that just has, for instance. Uh, and you and I have been in conversations with many of India's global business houses that, that, that grew out of India. Uh, and we've talked to them about, about many things as well as agricultural groups. So in putting you on the spot, I'm gonna ask you this question. When is Just going to start sourcing mung beans and manufacturing in India? Well, we, uh, we for the longest time, those same food sciences who uh, told me all about the mung bean have been telling me the market that we should get to the quickest is India. Um, and uh, they were they were bugging about bugging me so much about it. I eventually sent a group of four there um, to tell me what they thought. And they spent time in Mumbai and Delhi uh, at the Ganesh tea stall in Delhi, where they where they were giving away samples of just egg. And we eventually made a film called Born in India uh, that uh, the folks who are watching can uh, can take a look at at sort of our love letter to India about how thankful we are. Uh, that we were able to find the, find the mung bean um, and our excitement to actually bring it back uh, as, a, as an egg to India. Um, I can tell you, Varun, uh, about a week ago, without disclosing the company, I was on the phone with a chairman of one of the largest companies in India um, talking about coming there soon, uh, talking about their company doing large-scale manufacturing and distribution of Just Egg uh, within the year. Um, there's still a long way to go on it. Uh, but the next step for us is to find that partner. Uh, we want to find a partner um, that can purchase the Just Egg protein from us, can turn it into the finished product, whether that's the breakfast sandwich or the liquid product, and distribute it widely across the country. Um, the moment we find that partner, we sign an agreement, uh, is the moment we're coming, and, and I hope it's within the year. Yeah, and what's been fascinating to me, Josh, is that you started as a company that said you were going to displace animal protein. Right? You're going to displace the egg. But along the way, you've talked about this journey where, uh, in fact, you realize that you could utilize partnerships with some of the largest animal protein companies in the world. Uh, what, what kinds of partners have you been looking for? And what kinds of strategic partnerships have been really things that you would consider a major milestone for the company and for the sector? Yeah, so, Varun, when you, when you think about the, the process of bringing good food to people, humane, healthy, sustainable food to people, we always think about the technology side, right? The identification of functional proteins, yeast expression, um, advanced extrusion, um, uh, all the algorithms, algorithms and machine learning that companies are applying to food technology. And all that is really important. But there's another area that is equally important, and that's called the basic infrastructure to mix, pasteurize in our case, warehouse, bake, and distribute through a cold chain. That second part might seem boring, but again, it's just as essential. Um, and that infrastructure you can plug into, you can plug a technology into and it can get food to more people a lot faster. So what we realized along the way is some of the world's biggest egg companies are um, excellent at those kinds of activities. 
we're great at the technology and the brand, but we can plug into that infrastructure and get to where we're going faster. A good example is the, the place I'm staying at right now is an Airbnb. Um, Airbnb doesn't own the house that I'm staying in. It software, right? It's technology plugs into this infrastructure, uh, allowing it to monetize it effectively, right? I don't need to own all the infrastructure that gets the food out to the, the last person, but I do need to own the technology that plugs into it. So I just realized egg companies are great at that. And egg companies realize that they want to make more money. And an egg company could care less whether it's make money, making money selling an egg or making money selling a plant-based egg. If they can make more money selling plant eggs, trust me, they will do it. Um, and that's where we find we found alignment in, in how we could work together. And some of these partnerships are incredibly exciting, right? So we've talked about PHW, which is a major chicken egg uh, production company in Europe and, and Eurovo Group and Michael Foods, which, which is a huge North American company that distributes conventional egg products, um, and has now agreed to distribute the Just Egg. Uh, an additional dimension of your mission, as you've mentioned, um, and we've discussed at length, is to think about improving human health, particularly at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, we've talked about how India houses a third of the world's extreme poor in 2020, uh, and a very large proportion of its malnourished people too. So everything you do, Josh, and especially the egg, is moving in the direction of being able to, to target these kinds of problems at every level of the income pyramid because of your background. A major theme of this summit, the Smart Protein Summit, is focused on taking India and countries like India from scarcity to abundance when it comes to the protein supply over the next decade. Could you speak a little bit to the future direction of the egg? We're currently, I believe, at version 2.0 on the market in multiple iterations. Uh, what will 5.0 look like? Will it be an even greater powerhouse of nutrition? Will it be available to everybody? What's the direction that it's going in? Yeah, the future of Just Egg is far and away the lowest cost egg on the planet. So we want to get down under five cents per egg, which would put us as far and away the most cost effective egg on the planet and one of the most cost effective sources of protein on the planet. Um, we want to improve the taste where 75% of people are, are, are preferring this lowest cost egg to the best tasting pasta raised egg. We want to improve the nutrition where it's loaded with micronutrition to deal with the roughly 2 billion people around the world, many of them in India, who suffer from micronutrient deficiency. Uh, we want to add a little bit more protein. We want to reduce the sodium. We want to make it shelf stable so we don't require a cold chain in order to deliver it to every single person. And ultimately, Varun, it goes back to the book that I read in South Africa that is fundamental to the reason that I'm here, that the best way to solve the world's biggest problems is through capitalism. And C.K. Pradlad in his book talked about how business, if it ignores the bottom of the pyramid, it's ignoring an opportunity to do an enormous amount of good and also just grow as a company. Um, I look at our mission as building a healthier food system. Fundamental to that is making sure that our egg is serving all of the people at the bottom of the pyramid, providing micronutrition that they're currently not getting today, providing taste that they typically don't expect. At the end of the day, I would get a lot more out of selling more eggs uh, to uh, folks in that situation than I would with all due respect uh, to where I live in San Francisco, uh, folks in San Francisco who buy Just Egg at Whole Foods. That's what motivates me. Um, and, and that's the future of Just and the future of where Just Egg is going to be. That sounds very exciting, Josh. And it's, a, it's something that we greatly resonate with here at GFI India. Switching tracks for a little bit, um, you also have a division focused on cultivating meat directly from cells. Uh, when I tasted the cultivated chicken nugget at the office in SF, what struck, what struck me about the, the product in particular, because I haven't tasted anyone else's cultivated meat product more than once, Right. What struck me in particular was, well, firstly, it was a, it was a chicken nugget, right? There, there was no difference between it and a chicken nugget, which was, it was uncanny. Uh, the second thing is between the first time and the second time that I tasted it, which I believe were not that far apart in time, the product improved considerably. There was a thickness and a firmness to the nugget that was quite striking in terms of the way uh, it had changed. Yeah. What can you say about the path to market for cultivated meat over the next few years? Um, and especially, as you've said before, the possibility that it will first launch in Asia. Yeah, I, I think it's almost certain the first cultivated meat will be on a menu in Asia. Um, I think that even more today than 
than the last time we talked about it. The biggest limiting step to launching cultivated meat is regulatory approval uh, by one country, and I think that's likely to be a country in Asia. Once that happens, um, we're planning to launch with one or more restaurants, a small number of restaurants will, where it'll appear on the menu. Currently, we're scaling up product in a thousand liters. Um, in order to reach the type of scale that we ultimately need to reach to have a real uh, impact, it'll need to be 20,000, 40,000, 60,000 liters. So we have a ways to go on it. And I think a way of, of thinking about cultured meat is there are multiple phases to what scaling is. Phase one is launching, even if it's only on one menu at one restaurant. Phase two is scaling to a handful of retailers and hundreds of restaurants. It's an important phase. You're, you're beginning the process of bringing the cost down, bringing it to more people in a particular geography. Phase three is more or less where we are now. We're in multiple countries selling tens of millions of units uh, of, our, of our product. Phase four is much further down the line, but it's the phase that's required to ultimately solve the problem. And I call that the Coca-Cola phase. In more countries than the United Nations, a ubiquitous product that's available to everyone. For us to really solve the problem and for us to live in a world where more meat and eggs and dairy are consumed um, from uh, animals that don't have to die than animals that die, we need to get to, to that place. And um, that's gonna require an incredible amount of investment, additional technologies, uh, but it's gonna take us and, and a lot of the other great companies out there to continue to put our heads down, deal with the frustrations, deal with the regulatory uncertainties, deal with maybe some of the, the criticism from the industry um, and just keep plowing ahead. Yeah, and I can't stress enough how much uh, this is the decade that that needs to happen, right? I mean, we have to install the infrastructure, we have to get in the crucial strategic investment, the partnerships, the talent pool uh, that can actually make that happen. And that if we don't do it now, then we're going to be moving towards a more uncertain future. Uh, right. Josh, my final question to you on that note, what is our food system going to look like at the end of this decade? Uh, and what's making you hopeful about that future? I think at the end of this decade, we're going to see a, a couple of really important things happen. I think uh, one, um, more people are going to eat whole plants. Um, has nothing to do with technology. Uh, I think more people are going to be eating apples and spinach and collard greens and kale, uh, because if one looks at the evidence of nutrition, one would go that way. That one would go that way, and I I think people are beginning to open up their eyes as to what what the evidence is. The second thing is um, you're going to find um, uh, much more expansion uh, from our company and from other companies in this space, getting to a point at the end of the decade where you're getting close to a place where whether meat or eggs or milk, the vast majority of it that is consumed will not require killing a single animal. I don't think you'll be there quite yet. I think that's going to take probably a decade more but you're gonna get there. You're gonna be able to see it on the horizon. It's gonna become even more believable. Um, and that's why I'm excited, Varun. You know, we, we're simultaneously living in a time of frustration and um, political corruption and ineptness and a zoonotic disease, right? We're living in that time, but in the exact same time, we're living in a world that we can create on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? We're living in a world that we can build through the lens of ethics and kindness. Um, we're living in a world that if we just to choose to, we can build in a way that reflects who we actually are. Um, and I just feel enormously grateful to be a part of that. Right, We're living in a world where GFI is helping to create this enabling infrastructure where hundreds and thousands of entrepreneurs are deciding to stop doing what they're doing and start companies uh, that are reducing the suffering of animals and building a cleaner environment, man, that's the world I want to live in. And we just can't, we can't waste the opportunity. Uh, we have to maximize uh, every second. Um, and if we do, we're going we're gonna to make it happen. Josh, thank you so much for joining us at the Smart Protein Summit. It's been a huge pleasure as always. Thanks, Bruno. All right, well, that was our fascinating keynote session to kick off the Smart Protein Summit 2020. And I really can't think of a better way to get us started on the next few days of fascinating sessions. 
If you know me, you've often heard me say that we're not going to build a more healthy, sustainable, and just global food system over the next decade unless we figure out a protein supply for Asia, India, and the broader developing world, which is resilient. We're especially not going to do that without all of you in the audience today. The best time to have done this, to have worked on infrastructure development, installing talent pools, funding entrepreneurship and corporate innovation was really few, a few years ago or even decades ago. But the next best time is right now. That's why we're incredibly grateful and excited to have you with us over the next few days as we explore these questions that are integral to the future of our food system. Thank you very much and we look forward to seeing you later.